Thank you all so much for being here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Got it? Excellent. Uh, my name is Chris Spinato. I work for Reverb. We're an environmental nonprofit that works in music and harnesses the power of live music to uh, create real positive change, both environmentally and socially, uh, for the world. Uh, we are a partner uh, at the inaugural Cayuga Sound Festival, um, working on several different aspects that we're going to talk about today. Um, and so this talk is focused on uh, live music and the impact on the world. Um, so we are talking both environmentally and socially, which are two things that are very important to uh, ex ambassadors as, uh, as they work to create this uh, festival. We're seeing more and more impact um, across the board, uh, environmentally and socially, coming from artists and their fans through music. So we have a really interesting opportunity to start having that conversation, utilizing music as a platform. It's always sort of been a platform, but I think increasingly um, people are really striving to use music as a platform for good. So um, we have a really awesome panel to help us discuss that today. Um, so Seth Callen. Seth is the founder of This Fiction. He manages the ex-ambassadors and he is the co-founder of Big <coughs> Sound. Hi. Uh, Tanner Watt is my co-worker at Reverb. Tanner is the director of partnerships. Uh, he has most recently just returned from one of four trips out, or three trips out with Jack Johnson and did his greening for uh, his tour. We'll talk about that a little bit perhaps, but Tanner. Have ties to Glorious. Are you there? Yep, that's right. Excellent. <laughs> um, I'm scared. Um, Ty is a longtime manager of John Legend. She's also the founder of Friends at Work. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as well. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Dan Smalls and Dan Smalls Production, uh, right, based right here in Ithaca. Um, Dan is the promoter and um, Promoter of the festival. Yeah. That works. All right. Yes. <laughs> Seth, Seth's partner and co-founder. <laughs> Seth's partner and co-founder. <laughs> so, Cayuga Sound, um, beyond being a, bringing a music festival to Ithaca, the hometown of Ex Ambassadors, um, was really born out of a, an idea to do things right environmentally and then also support the local community. Um, so, at this year's festival. Um, <laughs> The founders and the band came together to try to create ways to impact um, the environment and the local community in a positive way. So it's been a bit of a process. So I was hoping, Seth, you could talk to us a little bit about how this all came to be and why it was important for the band to make this festival more than just about music. Um, so when we started talking about Cayuga Sound, we, you know, obviously there was a the main thing was, let's come back to Ithaca, let's do a big show, the band is from Ithaca. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but as we started talking about it more, you know, we got to, and knowing ex-ambassadors and what they're all about, we really thought through um, that, you know, their kind of place in, in the music industry right now, they want to do good. Um, and, you know, I, I've been friends with Adam, one of the founders of um, Reverb, and we've talked for a long time about how Reverb and X Ambassadors can work together and how the band can be out there helping the environment. And so when we realized we had this platform to, to, to do something, the band immediately said, whatever we can do to help people, whatever we can do to help the planet, just do it. You know, it was, we don't care if we make money on this festival, we just want to give back. And that's kind of been a through line in in everything that the band has been doing for the last couple years. Um, and then, you know, as we talked about different ways the band could give back through the festival, we just, mostly we kept coming back to, let's focus locally on the place that they grew up. Because, um, you know, and help not-for-profits that, you know, that help the band as kids. Um, so that was just super important to them. And then, you know, then when, when we started working with and talking to Dan, he obviously had relationships with a lot of the local not-for-profits that we supported, um, and he connected us with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah I, I think their their mentality of wanting to give back locally is great, you know, and it's and it's challenging. I mean, even yesterday, I, I got an email from or someone challenged me on Facebook and us 
to, to change the course of this organization because there's, there's terrible things happening with weather around the world, right? So there's always something bigger out there. But the band's focus, and I responded very clearly, we're going to donate a lot of money locally. That was the plan from day one. We're not going to change this in the middle. It's terrible what's happening. Let's talk about another way to do that, you know, and let's use music to help in that way. But here, you know, Sam was a counselor at Stewart Park at, at the Ithaca Youth Bureau. They're one of our benefactors. They hung out at GIAC after school. They're one of the people. Right over there is Community School of Music and Arts where they learn to play instruments. They're one of the benefactors. So every piece, every you look at all ten of them, there is a reason that they're involved. And, and it's great, you know, and, and I didn't feel bad at all. I, you know, of course I feel bad for the people who are suffering, but, but telling this, this gentleman yesterday that it was really important for us to keep this local because this band came from here, they worked their butts off, they put in the 10,000 hours that people always say they did. I watched them do it. I mean, they pounded on my doors when they were the Fuzz Brothers. They had, you know, uh, saying, put me on this show, put me on that show. And I'm like, who the hell are these kids? You know, they're sneaking out of high school to try and play on shows 10 years ago. So I respect them. I would, you know, when Seth came to me, he's like, hey, let's do this, and you're not going to make any money, and neither are we. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's do this. Thing. This is great. We're going to do it for that, and let's do it for good, you know? And that's what the, the motivation has been behind it. And my team doesn't hate me because they're, they feel the same way. You know, they're over in the park right now, sweating it for three days, building this thing, and they're doing it because they're having fun and they want to give back to you. So, you know, the band started it and we followed and said, let's go. Absolutely. Um, so, sticking on that point with the, the local support and supporting the local community, um, so the, uh, that was one of the areas where Reverb came to be involved. Um, and so, together we've partnered and are able to support 12 local nonprofits. Um, so, I don't know if you, uh, Dan or Seth, if you'd be able to talk a little bit, not all of the nonprofits, but maybe a few of them that kind of stemmed out of uh, Sam and Casey really coming forward and saying, we want to support these guys because they were so supportive to us growing up in this community. Um, I mean, Dan can probably speak to a lot of the, the the specific local ones that the guys, you know, grew up with, but um, one in particular that Ex Ambassadors has worked with a lot is Planned Parenthood. So oh, yeah. um, we made sure to focus on the, you know, the Ithaca branch or this area's Planned Parenthood. Um, and you know, with Ex Ambassadors, it's this isn't the only time they've done this. I mean, we did a concert in Los Angeles three, four months ago. Small show, sold out instantly. All the money went to Planned Parenthood. You know, they. I don't know if anyone's heard their song Hoping, but we put that out. Every stream, every sale of that song, the money goes to the ACLU. So, um, so you know, those, Planned Parenthood specifically was one they wanted to focus on, and then, I mean, Dan, you can talk about some of the others. Yeah, I mean, I, I covered a few of them, like the Youth Bureau and, and GIAC and Southside Community Center and, you know, uh, Ithaca City of Asylum. They all tie to bigger national causes, but this is where they're from and why not, you know, why not keep it here? You know, one of the ones that means a lot to me is Ithaca Underground. You know, I'm, I'm a promoter in town and, and, I, and, and everybody, you know, this is a stigma for promoters across the world. Everybody comes to the State Theater and they see a thousand people and a fifty dollar ticket and they say, Small's made fifty grand tonight. And they don't understand just what goes into that, you know? So so having a, a, a level to, to get to that and realizing how the music industry works. Ithaca Underground is not just a small promoter that puts on shows. They teach kids how to mix, how to make records, how to put on shows, how the industry works as a whole. And the bands that come out of there and grow with them. Uh, uh, and, and come to the level where our clubs start and then the theaters, then, you know, bands eclipse us and move on to the Live Nation. But that organization means a tremendous amount of town. They're a not-for-profit now. They've got a board. They're raising money. <coughs> they're, they're one of the benefactors. They're doing a show tonight at the, at the dock. I encourage all of you to go check out the five local bands that are playing there tonight. There, it shows you an amazing diversity of talent, from hip-hop to punk rock to noise. And, and that, that one means more to me than anything, because I've watched Bubba start as a kid and grow this thing into a wonderful organization. And now there's less kids coming up to me saying, you're making all the money, why aren't you paying us more? Because they understand how much risk you have to take and how much, you know, you're, you're risking losing 50 grand to make three or four. You know, and that's, you know, I, I, I feel like I was dropped on the ground as a baby and that's why I'm doing this. You know? <laughs> but it's, it's events like this that really matter the, the most. And that's been my mentality. I work for promoters. I mean, you talk about festivals. I, I came into the festival game I worked for a company called Great Northeast in Boston, and we did the first six fish festivals. And we learned how to make festivals in the United States. And we worked very, before Reverb was a company, we were trying to find ways, and you know, Fish was a, an organization that had their own green team. So they were really getting started in this before. So it was great to have you guys on board to help dictate how we could help them even more. Like we, 
we know how to sell tickets, but then we hand it off to you to, to, to take care of them once we get them on site. Yeah, and for the record, every week for the last six months, Reverb has been on the phone with us every Thursday morning at 11 a.m., helping us figure out how we can make this whole thing better, and it's been, you know, right. we kind of, Dan and I and the band had a lot of ideas on, here's who we want to support, here's what we want to do, and then we went, but we don't have time to figure it out, so you guys figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and we did for the most part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so um, I think it's also important to note um, that the support is not just financial. That's a big part of it. Um, right. We're raising money for these local organizations and um, everybody from the founders of this festival on down, um, everybody's been behind that. I think it's also interesting to note though that it's more than just about money. It's really bringing these nonprofits, these local community groups that are really making this a vibrant, stronger community are on site talking to the thousands of people that are going to be there tomorrow. Um, so it's really a strong platform for them to say, this is why we're here, this is why we're important, and this is why you should care. So um, I just wanted to kind of note that as well, because I think that's a big part of it. Um, it's more than just money, it's about really having a platform for being out there and talking to people. Well, the location was designed to make them the first thing that you see as you come in. As you come in, you'll you'll see them off to the left of the festival, and there'll be a whole village, and you guys are the center of it all, but, you know, um, but make sure you get there early enough to check that out. Yeah, um, and also, it just on top of that, it's it's very rare to have a festival do that. Usually, it's beer, so you know, for, <laughs> that's that's pretty big. That's a big step. Um, so, um, since we're, we're sort of been talking about the social impact of it, Ty, um, I wanted to bring you into the conversation. You've been a longtime manager of John Legend. John is known far and wide for being one of the most vocal activists in music. Um, so I just was hoping you could talk a little bit about social activism within music that you've worked with John to create and also um, at Friends at Work. Yeah, um, so it's kind of been in John's, you know, sort of part of who John is since he was a kid. I think when he, he grew up in Springfield, Ohio, and when he was 14, uh, McDonald's had an essay contest and it was during uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, celebration, and they were saying, what would you do to live up to his legacy? And write an essay about it, and you could potentially win, and I'm sure that the prize was something like free McDonald's for a week or something. But John wrote an essay, and of course it won. And what he said, even when he was 14, was, I'm going to grow up and become a musician, and I'm going to become an artist, but then I'll be known for that enough and have enough recognition that I'm going to leverage that platform to make positive change in the world. And he's gone on to do that and never kind of delayed his altruism in any way. He, he never thought sort of one day I'll, you know, I'll finally jump in when I'm making X, Y, and Z. From the beginning of his career, he stayed pretty committed. In fact, we did a reverb tour back in the day. Um, and you know, and for us, it, it's been a real process of learning uh, what and how you can make an impact. And it started with um, John kind of focused on poverty and extreme poverty, and we went uh, ex-US and got very involved. I think at that time, it was sort of, if you're looking at how Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we were hearing about young people dying in such useless ways. And so in our 20s, it was like, okay, we gotta solve that. And then, you know, we adjusted and thought, okay, we wanna stay focused on the ex-US, but also let's think about United States and the problems here and what do we want to solve and it came down to education and, and how can we sort of level the playing field and make sure that every kid has the opportunity for a quality K-12 education which is not an easy problem to solve and I you know over the 10 years that we've been working in the education space I think there were moments where it felt like we took you know one step forward and two steps back um, but, you know, you stick with it and you make progress and you learn and you understand kind of, okay, maybe we shouldn't have alienated the teachers' unions by saying what we said. Maybe we should have readjusted the message and I think you get older and you start to compromise more and you realize that solving a really difficult problem takes a lot of compromise, a lot of commitment, persistence, and, and that led us into this criminal justice space where, you know, John Legend did a John Cash and has been performing at jails, prisons, immigration detention centers all around the country speaking with people that are incarcerated and you know it started with a listening and learning tour because you want to sort of really take your time to understand the issue 
and then it led us to a number of sort of solutions that we're working on and a movement we started called Free America to end mass incarceration. And, um, and it's very rewarding and it's woven into everything we do. I think every single day we're reading some article, sharing some data, you know, we're on the board of um, the Quatrain Center for Justice at Penn Law, where we both went to college. And, you know, we think, and then we think locally too, John gives back in his hometown of Springfield, Ohio, and built sort of an arts center there. Um, so it, it does take a real commitment, but I think once you get into that practice and that habit of social impact, you really don't ever slow down, and it becomes probably one of the most, it, it becomes almost as rewarding, if not more so, than getting a hit on the radio. Um, and so in our company, Friends at Work, that's really our, our ethos. We want to work with artists that want to leverage their platform to do good in the world. And it's become kind of our, like our, probably our biggest filter for whether we think we can partner with an artist or not. Are they the type of artist that is, is willing to go the distance to do something uh, impactful in a positive way in, in their career? And, and how does music elevate the conversation or allow that conversation to happen? Yeah, I mean, music is you're probably you know one of your biggest tools for activism because if you can get into someone's heart and make them feel something, then you can really start to change. You know, giving someone data and stats and figures, they might go, oh, that's a shame that we're the most incarcerated country in the world. But if you sing a song about it, and, and John Legend has a tour where you know there's a giant screen of civil rights images and he's singing to you and making you cry about the injustice of, of the world. Um, you know, chances are you're going to feel inspired to do something, and and now we've gotten even further into sort of film and television and digital content. Um, we have kind of a whole division of our company that just can do that and and really tell stories and change the narrative to get people to act and give them action items. You know, because it's one thing to sort of wake them up, but then you got to go like, okay, now here's your to-do list. Like, go go get to work, um, and and. We're trying. We're constantly trying to do that better. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a promoter, I think more more artists should do that. I mean, it, it's great that they're putting a dollar on the ticket to give to charity. That's great, you know, and that's wonderful. But that's not enough. Step one. Yeah. No, it's not enough. I mean, in in the '60s, the protest singers changed the culture. They changed. It. And if, have we ever needed a fucking protest singer more than today? I mean, someone's got to have the balls to stand up and say something. And I, and I applaud ex-ambassadors for, for taking a stand, and John Legend, you know, there's not enough of them, and they should get more press, because they're doing the hard work. You know, putting a dollar on a ticket is easy. I can do that too, but I'd rather stand up and say what I believe in, and have the people follow you that way, you know? I mean, they, yeah, definitely. Here, here. I mean, and, and it's it's not without, I guess, a little bit of risk. You know, I mean, John and Chrissy get trolled and you know, you know all sorts of right. like angry messages on Twitter whenever they say or do anything that they believe in. But it's they never stop because of that. And I don't think Bruce Springsteen has ever stopped. And there are so many great artists that you know we we can look to. And I think young artists do need to sort of carry the baton forward from. Harry Belafonte and, and Marvin Gaye and, and all the activists, Dylan, and people who have kind of committed their life to that. I also think it's just natural for artists to sort of be more progressive in general. They're, they're thinking about the world, they travel the world, they see other communities, they see what's going on, they're driving in a bus around the country, they see people more than some of us in more isolated spaces that may not really have the perspective of what's going on, and so they, they can carry that message and they can hopefully connect on a heart level so that it's not too divisive, but can actually unify and maybe open people's hearts and minds a bit. Yeah, and you know, Dan, when you said there's not enough artists actually speaking out, I and mean, I think there's, you know, being a manager, we, we come across so many different artists every day that we're friends with or work with or, you know, what have you, and I think because there's so because there's the ability for people to troll people and just throw crap at them online that a lot of artists tend to just kind of stay completely silent and go it's all sunshine and happiness and listen to our music and you know stream our song and you know then you get a band like X, X Ambassadors who you know to be honest they, they can be aggressive with their Instagrams and things about you know what's happening in the world, but and then you know you get the occasional person that works around them saying, 
do you think we might uh, lose some fans in this part of the country, or do you think do you think we might piss people off a little bit? And we say, you know, we are absolutely not going to change that. We're going to do it even more because you know we don't. We're not. Sam is never trying to you know, hurt anybody's feelings, and he's never saying anything that would be disrespectful, but he's often online and at shows, you know, really saying what, what at least in his and our opinion, people need to hear. Now, people will obviously disagree with the band and disagree with him, and I think Sam wants nothing more than to have conversations with those people, and, and it be, you know, a respectful, positive thing, but as soon as you start getting the kind of people in the suits in the music industry going, you know, coming to me at least, or going to the band going like, maybe you should tone down the, you know, the Trump stuff or something, we go, nope, sorry, not gonna happen. Right. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think it's very important to point out that, you know, in my opinion, if you're not pissing someone off, you're not doing it right. <laughs> um, I, I came to Reverb from working for years with uh, Willie Nelson and his family, and he's one of the oldest activists still performing. <clears throat> And he had a great saying that we're not happy till you're not happy. <laughs> Basically, if you believe in something, then believe in it and be who you are. Um, I think any musician faces criticism for their art right out of the gates. I mean, nobody's ever going to love every song on the radio, so you're used to not pleasing everyone from the beginning. And I think that every musician is sending a message and encouraging something, whether or not they think about it or realize that they're doing it. I mean. People in this country, you know, kids will buy a silly hat because an artist wore a silly hat. Kids will wear pants that are uncomfortable because an artist wore pants that were uncomfortable. Maybe kids will register to vote or learn about issues in a midterm election or do something better for the planet or get involved in the community because a rock star does. And I think that, you know, I, I give, you know, all of the credit in the world to the artists who are willing to alienate some fans. Because honestly, if you don't believe or agree with the person's heart, then what are you doing listening to their music in the first place? I, I really think that you know, this is a time uh, that you know, we're seeing. It, it, there hasn't been a more important time to be an activist or to be involved in my lifetime. And you know, looking at the history of music, these great songs that we look back to on and that we associate with the civil rights movement or you know, the summer of love or the hippie movement, those songs weren't just the soundtrack to the, to that time period, those songs were a catalyst. I mean, Pete Seeger's banjo was was part of the civil rights movement. And I think that artists today, looking back, it, it, it's a matter of legacy. And how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered for who you are and what you believe? Or do you want to be remembered for some white bread track that was popular to every person in the country, you know? I mean, to me, I think it's, it's exciting and inspiring to work around artists who are not afraid to speak their mind and not afraid to say what they believe. Just like every person in this room shouldn't be afraid to speak their mind and say what they believe. And whether or not you have a microphone or a soapbox to say it from, you know, I encourage all of you to, to, to raise your voice, and I'm proud to work alongside the artists who do. I mean, I think in today's world, it's almost a little harder to get heard and to gain traction. I mean, no offense, and I don't want to get too overly political, but look who this country elected after some of the things he said and did and quickly went out the window when 16 years ago, Howard Dean might have been the best candidate we ever had. And he went, ah, raised his voice once, and he was out. So people got scared by, by what happened to him, I think, years ago. But now you can say anything and do anything, and it's like the news cycle's over with. So you can't just do it once. you got to stay on it. I don't know how much, the, you know... The, the way society has changed is affecting this as well. I, mean, I remember growing up and watching MTV and like the VMAs and seeing REM wear like political t-shirts and have a lot to say and yeah. you know like even but now it's weird it's these word shows it's like it feels very kind of like I, I, no one's saying anything the, the rock and roll has become like far less sort of urgent and and critical of the moment and of culture um, or maybe it's just more that those shows are so mainstream that like it's, it's not a platform that anybody wants to use anymore, but I think they should. I mean, not that that many people are tuning into these shows, but when John was on the Oscars and, you know, he won an Oscar for the song uh, Glory in the film Selma, you know, he got up there and had his moment um, and he said, we're the most incarcerated country in the world. We have more black men incarcerated behind bars than we did in slavery in 1850. And... I remember my mom called me from Philly and she was like, what? Johnny's 
smoking, like, that's not true. That's not true. Like, Iran and Russia, like, must, and I was like, no, mom, look it up, Google it. It's like, true. And then, uh, and that was what was so interesting. This was like, year, this was a few years ago, and so many people fact-checked it, and I remember watching the news site, but they were like, whoa, that's actually true? Like, just that awareness was kind of something. And then when you can have a platform like that with, I don't know how many millions of people tune into the Oscars, but you should use your tours, you should use your platforms, TV, you know, it's, and as a star like John, you get a lot of opportunity to have your voice heard. So he couples like the, the beautiful love ballad and the song that's going to make you kind of like him. I do feel bad for the people though that like tweet something like, all of me was our wedding song, but I hate you now. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad, you know. Sorry, and John's like, you, you, like you didn't know who I was. Like I've always been an activist, you know. I love that your mom calls John Legend Johnny. Yeah, she's known him since he was a kid, so love she that. gets that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to shift the conversation a little bit, um, just because. Um, <laughs> environmentalism is so important to what Reverb does, and talking about activism, that's a huge part of it. Um, so Reverb was started by a musician, um, Adam Gardner of the band Guster, and um, basically to do this, um, to take on an issue that was prevalent, and to use music as a platform to take on that issue. So, um, you know, we're doing it at this festival, we're seeing more and more festivals do it. Um, and Tanner, I wanted to turn it over to you, especially working with um, Jack Johnson and, and other like leaders in this. What are you seeing um, as far as change in the music industry for the environment? Whether it's um, on-site actions or in, um, artists standing up for um, different environmental causes. I, th I think there's a, a range of things. I, I think that over my six years with Reverb, and since Reverb was founded in 2004, we've seen more and more artists move into a space where they want to consider their environmental impact, want to consider the potential of engaging fans around important issues. Uh, one of the things that I find exciting is many of the bands that we're seeing join our, our ranks now are not the bands you would expect. I mean, we've worked with The Dead and & Company and Fish and Jack Johnson for years, and those are kind of the artists you would expect to be, to be doing these things. Uh, now we're out on the road with the Zach Brown Band, we're working with Casey Musgraves, we work with <laughs> Movie 5, we work with Linkin Park, so we're seeing more and more artists who are more mainstream, uh, dealing, uh, looking at the environmental issues and also at the social issues. Um, so I think that that's very exciting. And then I think that in the last um, year or so especially, uh, we're seeing more and more artists stand up, environment, social, all of these issues all come together. They're all dealing with the same person right now. Uh, the problem is what the problem is. Um, and I think that we're finding more and more ways to combine social and environmental issues. And artists are realizing that there's a lot of crossover. Um, realizing that communities of color are more and more affected uh, environmentally than other communities. Uh, childhood asthma rates in African American communities are 50% higher than in Anglo communities. Um, there's basically the people, underserved communities in this country, are affected the worst by climate change. And we're seeing issues there. We're also working with veterans group, uh, veterans groups and trying to train vets coming back from uh, the military and getting out of the military to be solar installers and finding ways to deal with the social issue of veterans' health and reintegration and also combining that with the clean energy industry. So I see that there's more and more ways to combine social issues and environmental issues and more and more artists are uh, willing to take my calls. Uh, that's that's a, a big one. Um, and the conversations are a lot more in-depth now. Um, years ago, we would go through three and four levels of management before getting a baby, and then we'd come back six months later and work on a harder baby. Um, now, I find very often that it's the artists themselves who want to talk about an issue and want to learn more about different nonprofits in that space, who they can support, ways they might, can, they might be able to support the cause, and that, to me, is super inspiring. Uh, when the actual artist wants to talk to me about what the issue is, how they can get involved, then I feel like you know we're breaking down barriers. When you know, if it's John Legend, if it's ex-ambassadors, when the band themselves care, and care to the point of, hey, I want to go and work with you know the nonprofit guys and get my feet or my hands dirty, I think that uh, that's a, a really good sign. And so, you know. Politically, it is what it is, but I think that we're seeing more and more people stepping up and trying to change things for the better. So, yeah, and I've been in, in very impressed by Reverb because I think when when I first started talking to you guys, it was actually pretty early in 
<clears throat> ex ambassador's career, and I think we probably even spoke about Jukebox the Ghost or something. So you, so I mean, what's amazing about Reverb is they're actually working with these artists at you know arena levels and giant festivals down to. You know, we did college shows with, I think we did a college show maybe two years ago with Jukebox the Ghost and Ex Ambassadors and Reverb was there and finding ways just to raise tiny bits of money or do tiny things, you know, do anything they can. So that's, you know, I think that kind of through line should be true for people too. I mean, from, you know, you don't have to be John Legend to do something to make a difference. You can be a kid in a band, you know, and I think. Um, so when you know when you guys first reached out to us, we gravitated immediately. Actually, I think when you first reached out, it was probably because it was Adam from Guster who were my first concert and my favorite band. So I said, I'll do anything. Um, <laughs> um, the truth comes out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I do want to save a little bit of time to open up uh, to questions from the audience here, but real quick, um, I, I think it's important to sort of end the conversation on. What can we do? So we're all coming at this from slightly different angles uh, within the music community. Um, what do we do to start using music more to start really creating real positive change for the environment? That's a tough question, so yeah. anybody's going to go first. A festival like this is a great start. You know, most, most promoters start festivals, and festivals are popping up and going away as quick as they come. And most of them are started because they're dictated and, and, and the motivation is the almighty dog. I mean, let's be honest, right? This is one that is not motivated by that. This is one that is motivated by giving back to this town. It's a boutique festival. It works because it is Ex Ambassador's vision. I have nothing to do with this festival outside of saying, fellas, what do you want and how can we make it happen? And that's what we did. And it was their vision. I didn't pick the bands. I didn't pick the not-for-profits. I didn't pick any of that stuff. I said, who do you want to support? And how can I help you do that? And Seth and I worked that way from day one. So if more bands put boutique things like this on, where they could stand up for the things they really care about and keep talking about it, that's step one. I mean, from an artist's perspective, that's the easiest way to do it. You know, they're not all going to do it for nothing. And there's costs involved. But you know what? This is an investment in doing this every year and speaking to larger audiences each time. You know, and if we eventually make some money for all this effort, great. We'll, it'll give us more to donate ourselves. I think one thing that, um, that ex-ambassadors have been doing that I think uh, artists that are similar to them, I actually, Ty and I were talking on the phone maybe a month or two ago. Um, ex-ambassadors were playing a show that was, in theory, a little bit controversial that they were there. We didn't know who some of the other guests were going to be until an hour before they hit the stage. Bam, the band was going, oh shit, like, what are we, you know, is this going to look bad on us? We do not want to be a part of this. Should we cancel the show? And I said, don't cancel the show. And, you know, when I was speaking to Ty, we took a step back and we said, you know, a band like Ex Ambassadors, who in theory write songs that are, you know, they're not highbrow. It's not. It's not something that's just for the coasts. It's just for LA and New York people or something. It's. It's pretty universal how their music resonates with people. And so, you know, we started thinking about well, there's no reason that they should. Uh, I don't know. Only be doing these events and playing things just for their, you know, their democratic leaning ideals. Like they are the type of artists that can go to parts of America that maybe don't want to hear what they have to say or maybe do and they can they can actually you know converse with people and converse with fans that might not want to hear their side of things so I think that um, you know one thing more artists can be doing is you know I don't know going going and being a part of the conversation around the country in situations where they're maybe thinking I don't know if I don't know if I'm gonna get some bad looks when I'm saying this in you know wherever I am, so. Yeah, I think a lot of these issues are, you know, they're going to be solved on a local level. The federal government can only do so much, which I kind of like <laughs> to remind myself of when I think about how bad Jeff Sessions and Trump could make it for criminal justice reform, but really all of the reform is happening, <laughs> the biggest reform is happening on the local level. Um, and you think about an artist in a tour, it's like a, it's like a grassroots campaign. I mean, they're, they're in small communities and, and markets all around the country, and again, driving past towns, and I do think there's more opportunity for that 
local connection. Um, so when John was doing the prison tour, it was like we would go, we would perform, and have conversations, and then he would go and meet with a local legislator and talk about passing a certain kind of reform uh, to end juvenile life without parole. Um, and when he shows up, because he has that convening power, all sorts of people would show up, even if they weren't necessarily on his side. And it's been kind of remarkable to see the, the impact we've had with certain local legislation because he showed up and, and convened more people to the conversation and changed you know, perspectives. And, and that's in addition to a number of other, you know, sort of staying on the local level with reporters and journalists who are covering a particular issue. And so I think the more we attack and approach these issues with that mindset of like, how do we, how do we think about this locally? How are different states and cities and, and counties going to like fix these issues together? Um, I think, it, you know, an artist can play a, a good role in that strategy because they're going from place to place. And I think it obviously in the next elections, we want to we want to vote who, who we want in. And I think it's important that we kind of leverage that same ability on, on the road. Um, so yeah. yeah. I think a big part of it is just artists leading by example. Um, I think that any individual should do what's right. And if you don't, if you don't understand something, ask questions. And if you know something's wrong, speak up and say something. I think that the exact same thing holds true for every artist out there. Um, you know, art is a reflection of the artist, and you know, when an artist believes in something and they're willing to speak their mind in their art, I think the art is more powerful, um, and it encourages the fans to take action. Um, as as many people as John Legend can get in front of, the real impact comes when his fans follow his lead. Um, Ex ambassadors' fans follow their lead. That's when the real impact comes. So. I would just say, you know, it's, it's all about leading by example and, you know, continue speaking your mind, artists, fans, and everyone in between. But, but as a final thought, you got to do that outside your comfort zone, Absolutely. in my opinion, because, yeah. you know, I, I live here in Ithaca, and Ithaca is not a, a secondary market, even it's a tertiary market. You got, you know, there's LA and there's New York, and that's where the music industry is, and it's easy to preach to the choir there, you know. Probably a little harder to be as surprised there as it was here, but this is an insulated community. You know, so on November 9th, there was a lot of people like, you know, what just happened? You know, I'm a cyclist. I rode 6,000 miles on a bike last year. You go five miles any direction, you know why that happened. You know, so you can stand on the commons outside this building and preach all you want. You're preaching to the choir. you got to motivate people to go five miles outside this town and talk to people. you got to play places you'd never think of if you want to reach the right people. You know, don't, I mean, granted, I don't want to come play Ithaca too, but while you're here, go visit some stuff outside, you know. It, it, there's more, you know, it, no one's ever going to choose to play Podunk Town. But while you're there, speaking, you know, who would think that the representative from Ithaca is probably the worst in the country? I mean, no offense, and Tom Reed, I'm, I'm going to speak to the camera, <laughs> and you should just quit. But I mean, aside from you, you know, who would think that guy represents this town, you know? So, uh, it's, it's get outside these places, because you're insulated here, and you're speaking to people who are your way. It's a smart, educated college town. They're going to lean to the, to the liberal side. So yeah, um, so let's open it up to uh, any questions that anyone might have for the panel, uh, or about, well, anything you like within the confines of this conversation, we'll <laughs> try to keep it within that. But, uh. And also, just so everyone knows, after this, we're going to take a little, we're going to do Q and A for a few, take a break, and then uh, around twelve, the guys from X Ambassadors will be here. We're going to do a whole other talk with them from twelve to one. So, How important or unimportant do you guys think issue identification is with an artist? Uh, for instance, criminal justice for John, Willie Nelson with Farm Aid, um, is, uh, the, uh, uh, George Clooney with, with Somalia, um, Leo DiCaprio with the environment and wildlife, that they're, they're particularly focused on those issues and they're identified with those issues. Are there benefits, drawbacks to that kind of sort of brand identification? Yeah, we you know we probably get 50 requests a week for John Legend to perform at something that's incredibly worthy. All of them, you know, and you you could spread yourself too thin. And if you don't have clarity and focus of message, I think people might think, wait, one day you're for this, next year for that. I can't get up to speed. I mean, it ta and it takes a time to really become somewhat of a an expert on these issues and uh, to know what you're talking about. So I think it's important that all of us pick like our thing. But I do like the idea of you, you, you 
you have you have something XUS that you support, you have something like nationally that you support, and then something locally. And and if you can't do all three of those, you know, maybe sort of like pick, pick one that you're most passionate about because the more the more your emotional passion feel like you can kind of dive into that, probably the deeper you're going to go and the more you're going to accomplish. And um, but you know it's hard. I mean it's 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 hard when there's a really important issue in a moment like. Hurricane relief, you know, it's like John, that's not criminal justice, it's not education stuff, but it's like John has to jump in. You have to jump in when there's certain big moments where we all come together and we solve a problem, and I, I think that's important to do, uh, you know, in the moment when we need it. I would agree. I, I think that, you know, there's benefits to not choosing one cause because you can continue supporting lots, but I, I certainly agree with Ty that it, your, your message gets diluted if you have too many causes out there. Um, you know, all these artists care about lots of, there's so many worthy causes out there, but I think choosing one or two to really focus on, on Jack Johnson's tour, Jack focuses on sustainable community-based food systems, uh, and also single-use plastic waste alternatives. And so even though we have 10 or 12 nonprofits at every show on that tour, all of them fall under the umbrellas of those two pieces of messaging for the same reasons. Jack cares about all of these different things, but if he doesn't pick a cause or two to focus on, that message gets diluted, and then people are, you know, you, you get 50 people supporting you on this one and 50 people supporting you on that one instead of thousands of people getting behind you on one issue. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's hard for a, a kind of young, newer artist to even figure that out, and I would almost ask you two, because you've been around Jack for a long time and John for a long time, um, you know, you have an artist like X Ambassadors who, like you said, there's so many opportunities and worthy causes and only in the last maybe 24 months did they even have the opportunity to actually make a difference. So, you know, at first it was email from this person, do this thing, can you raise money for this? And we were like, yes, 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 yes. And then every day we're posting something about, so we're supporting, you know, uh, young kids with disabilities, but also the ACLU, but also, oh, we want to do this for the environment. And, you know, we're now, as we go into the second album, and the band has now kind of gone like this and now grown up and we're figuring it out. You know, I almost ask you guys, like, where did you see um, John or Jack Johnson or whoever kind of start to go, okay, now I'm going to start making a choice. Yeah, we, we had the same thing when John started. It was like, let's do every benefit, let's, you know, fund different things, let's get behind stuff, and you show up. You show up and you build the Goodwill bucket and you start to get, like, practice in, in terms of, like, learning about a ton of issues. I see Lindsey Sterling's been doing that from our roster, uh, Fletcher from our roster. So a lot of the young artists, they kind of like look at the landscape first because they're not even sure what they want to focus on. Um, and then I think, you know, it takes a real sort of commitment to hone in and to say, not only am I going to like narrow my focus and this is the issue I'm going to try to tackle. Sometimes I get a little frustrated if artists pick one that's already got like a ton of attention. So, you know, we try to, we try to tell young artists like, look, it, this one over here is like Oprah's into it. Everybody's covering it. Like, why don't you, you know, if you're if you're interested in mental health awareness for for teens, because that's a really important thing. Let's talk about like, or if you love kids, like some artists will just be like, I love kids and I love teenagers, and it's like, okay, well, what about that? The, what their issues? So then you give them a landscape breakdown of like, these are the ten things that are affecting teenagers, kind of in the most, and these are the four that are getting absolutely no attention. So how about we focus on those? And you could become the person that is focusing on and raising awareness around an issue that just does not have enough awareness yet. And, and that's generally how you kind of hone in. And then the artist has to make a real commitment to, to not just throw like a rubber chicken dinner once a year, although that's like the dollar on the ticket. It's fine. It's good. It's a good first step. But you start to actually invest in more of a full-time, robust infrastructure and team to help you build programmatic elements, to help you yeah. make the right grants, to help you get the right op-eds written in the New York Times. Like, you have to kind of, you have to pay, you have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to, like, really invest your time and read articles and read books. And it's, it's a lot, but it's what it takes to be sort of an engaged citizen, and especially one that has that kind of power to influence people. I mean, I think I... We all influence people, and then you've got an artist that is playing in front of 10,000 people or 5,000 people a night, and, and they have this exponentially bigger way of sort of getting a message across. So 
they, they have a lot of responsibility on their shoulders and I think it can feel like a burden. But the more we see artists that were able to do it, you know, yeah, you're going to make mistakes or it's going to feel hard and there's going to be times where, but you just kind of, that's why I'm hoping like what John Legend has done and artists who came before him, you know, as Harry Belafonte was calling John and going like, dude, step up, you know, like the, it wasn't like John was always kind of ready to do it. And there were definitely times where he was like, this is too serious, man. People think I'm too serious, you know, but, but like the, you, know, you just, you find your way through it and you just keep at the sort of North Star of like, I will try to make a positive difference. And that's all any of us can do. Um. I, I certainly second the uh, trying to choose a segment of your cause that's not already supported by so many people. And the one thing that I will add to that is I think that the guys in ex-ambassadors are doing it exactly the right way. They're looking at the groups that affected them. But to me, it's I'd rather go to an artist and ask them what in your life, what's the cause that matters to you? Is there something that happened to you when you were younger? Is there somebody you relate to or inspired by? What cause matters to you? And then let us as an organization, Reverb, help you vet the, the nonprofits that are doing that sort of work and find the right partner, um, rather than going to an artist and saying, this is the cause that you should support. Um, I think that you know music fans nowadays can smell bullshit pretty far away. And, <laughs> They like to feel connected to an artist. They like to feel like they're closer to the artist because they're supporting something that's genuinely important to that artist, uh, rather than an artist just endorsing something like they would, you know, a, a bottle of tea or a, a pair of shoes. It's it's really something that's truly important to them, um, and if it's truly important to you, it'll truly be important to your fans. Awesome. Uh, another question. I'll start by commending you guys all for this because the actions speak louder than words and I've known Dan for a while, Suzanne, here. <laughs> um, I started my career with Tony Bennett. Now, he didn't say anything about anything. I saw pictures of him on Selma. I got a call from Coretta Scott King in the office and I realized right then and there the actions speak louder than words and he took a stance. You know, if Duke Ellington couldn't take the front door, he wouldn't, he'd go in the back door, he wouldn't play at all. And so I come right through to the digital era of today. I work for Madison Square Garden. And what I'm trying to do is preserve the money to be used on your tours into New York to be able to, to speak these words. And you might think, oh, that's political. But the bottom line is the actions speak louder than words. And what you're doing tangibly, starting in Ithaca, reaching out and touching right across the community, person to person. Um, what I want to say is reverb is very important and digital platforms are important. But I think the bands like this today and what you know promoters like Dan are doing are, are just so important and commendable. And and what you'll find is I never I had to ask Tony, I said, You actually were down, you know, on Selma. I mean, he never told me that. He wasn't going like, you should take this stance, I'm a Democrat, I will do this, you know. So I, I think right now I was really impressed because I knew you know, from the tens of millions of spins on Spotify, who the ex-ambassadors were. But just this festival brought an immediate awareness to me, who's been in the industry for like 28 years or something, to say this is commendable. I want to thank you guys so much for bringing this to light. And I think <coughs> that they just continue keeping true to the action and tangibly touching the people live in their shows. You know, all the rest of like what platforms are we taking and what are we picking? You know, I think it'll all come to light, and I just want to congratulate you guys all. This is a lot of work, and I think the message is loud and clear all the way to New York City, and where we are today. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's hard for fans to realize the impact they have, but it's even harder for the old guard in the industry to realize how bands are reaching things there. Like, I, I don't really read the left sets letter too often, but this morning it caught my eyes because he was talking about Glass Animals. He went to a show in L.A. last night and was like, Holy shit, there were 4,000 kids and they knew every word. Where did they come from? And I've done five shows with this band. They were selling out 1,200 seaters three years ago, you know? So the people, even at the, you know, in the industry who are respected, are missing it. And, but the act themselves are reaching people so much easier. So that's why this is, this is a wonderful partnership to have, because those fans, you can touch them now in this digital, you know, social media world. It, it, but it's also hard to accept that you have that level of, of power. So for John to make that choice and for ex-ambassadors to get to this level and say no once in a while, you realize that you have that, that, that uh, ability to reach a large group. And it's hard to accept that, I think, for them. I don't know. I've, I've chosen a life in the shadows off to the side, you know, uh, of just connecting them with their fans. But when you focus on that, that's our, mo our motto. I, you know, I, I don't look at the dollars on a show. I'm like, I stand in the wings. Make money, lose money. There's an artist and a fan connecting. And that's the motivation right there. And if you're right more than you're wrong, then you're doing a good thing. But, you know, that connection is the same as what we're talking about here. Absolutely. 
Uh, I think we had a question towards the back. On the yes. Um, so earlier you guys were talking about how um, by taking some sort of stand, you can end up alienating a lot of fans. But I think also, particularly the past couple of years, you can also gain a lot of fans if you're choosing your shoes as well. Um, and I'm just curious what you guys think about that. Is that sort of an end justify the means sort of thing? Does it matter where the motivation comes from? Can people smell the authenticity or lack thereof? What do you guys think about that? I, mean, I think people definitely can smell the authenticity or the inauthenticity. Um, you know, yes, artists can definitely lose fans by taking a stand, I think, you know. But, but the, the funny truth, though, is I have a suspicion that even the internet trolls who comment on X Ambassador's page and say, I'm never listening to you again, like, I can't believe you, I want my guns, and the, like, you know, you see this, and Sam refuses to look at the comments because it just would upset him, but I, I end up reading all of them. Um, but, you know, I, my suspicion is that the truth is that those people are probably still listening to me. And they still have renegades on their, you know, morning coffee playlist or whatever, and they're probably still a fan. Um, but I think you're right that, you know, you risk it either way. But as an artist, you can also gain fans, you know, and uh, you know, you because you want to show that you're human. And I think if an artist is human, people will gravitate towards them. I mean, I think that. You know, this is not an alienating, alienating concept, but the Ex Ambassador's Renegades music video about people with different disabilities doing amazing things, that, that was not some like high concept that we crafted for months thinking, here's how we're gonna get to people, but you know, once we put that music video out, we, it, we, it quickly reached a lot of people, and then people associated the band with you know, specific cause or doing good and learned about them and so that gained them a ton of fans, you know, and probably way more than if we would have tried to sit in a conference room thinking about a catchy viral video or something, but, you know, um, so and maybe maybe that video also made some people uncomfortable, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe some people watched it and said, I don't, I don't want to see a guy climbing who, you know, doesn't have any arms or something like that. You know, maybe, maybe some people didn't like that, but, um, but I think it just brought a lot of people in and made a lot of new fans and helped a lot of people. I mean, it, within the first six months of that video com coming out, I think that's also when we started receiving just emails every week from people and organizations and the reverbs of the world and just people going, well, they're not just some boring alternative rock band that I heard on the drive at five show or something. Like, they seem to mean something, and they seem like really good people. How can we work with you? So, um, so yeah, that's what I think. Awesome. And I think we have time for one more question, if, if anybody else has a question. Yes, not? Okay. <laughs> well, um, so it's always hard to wrap up something like this, and I don't know that I have any words of wisdom for everybody to leave with, but um, as somebody who's worked uh, in an environmental nonprofit and, and just a nonprofit in general, um, it's meant so much to us to have the artist's uh, support, and it means a lot to us to be able to support the artist in their cause. Um, and I think, you know, we, we are in a tough situation in this country in many ways. The world is experiencing a lot of tough things, and this type of thing, starting from truly the ground floor, I mean, working with local nonprofits, working with a band that's starting um, to, well, a meteor rise, frankly, um, you know, this is how it starts to change, and people coming to these talks and coming to the festival and supporting what the artists are doing, what the nonprofits are doing, what the promoters are doing, um, you know, it, it means a lot. So um, I think my final comment would really be to you folks, um, there's only so many artists in the world there's only so many people that work in music. There's a hell of a lot of music fans out there. And so I think, um, you know, we, Reverb is built on that. So if you can take your shared love of music and take it out into the world and start spreading it, that's where Reverb came from. Sorry to keep speaking about Reverb, it's just on my mind a lot. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that one person connecting with one other person at a show reverberates out through the crowd, through the community, through the state, and beyond. So. Um, don't underestimate your power to affect that change. So, um, unless we have any other 
comments? I just wanted to also thank you guys all for coming because we had, when we put this whole festival together, part of the idea was we wanted to do a little talk series just to test it out for future years in Ithaca. So we thought there was a good chance that maybe three or four people would come to this one. So thank you all for being here. Um, and just please make sure to stop by the River Eco Village. There's so much amazing stuff to check out. We're raffling off signed guitars and signed posters for different causes. So just please stop by. Um, really cool and water bottles. Really cool water bottles that we've sold a ton of. Um, so we're trying to make it as plastic free, free as possible. So buy a water bottle, fill it up. We have fill stations. So um, thank you. And you stick around, enjoy the next talk, and enjoy the festival.